This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilderbeasts, we are going to talk about a giant dog skeleton and a big foot. Today got weird, y'all. All right, let's go. Okay. So here's my intro. It's going to be short. It's going to be sweet. Or it's it's going to be at least short. So we got this new house and we're in the process of moving. So this episode will either be a regular episode or a bonus episode in the Patreon feed. And I guess you'll know when you hear it where it ended up. (laughs) And with all of that said, it's just been a hectic couple of weeks. I had a minor although I'm fine, surgery in the middle of all of it. And we're trying to say goodbye to all of our awesome community here, getting my kiddo registered for school and trying to figure out what she's going to need when we move to a new state. So it's been a little busy. I really appreciate all the support and the awesome texts that I've been getting from all of you or DMs. Keep them coming because it really does. um, It helps me it just helps me. It, it's hard to do things knowing I'm moving away from our community, um, but knowing that there's this other community here that's listening, that's participating, and this is for you. So I hope you guys like it. Um, and I'm not going to try to give too much away here. It's a really fun episode based on something I saw on Facebook. So take that with whatever grain of salt you want to take it with. All right, let's go. So a few weeks ago, a photo came across my Facebook feed. It was of two skeletons entwined in an unmistakable moment. One skeleton was a large dog. I assumed it was a big greyhound and that I wasn't that far off. It was an Irish wolfhound. And the other skelly was a man. The dog was standing on his back legs. His forelegs were nearly in a hug, with the human skeleton leaning back ever so slightly in that way that every person who's ever interacted with a dog understands fully. I love you, buddy, but don't lick the face. Who was this guy? What's up with this person and puppy pair of post-postmortems? The man was Dr. Grover Krantz. The dog? Oh, he was Clyde. According to a Smithsonian article from 2009, Dr. Krantz told David Hunt, an anthropologist working at the Smithsonian Museum at the time, I've been a teacher my whole life, and I think I might as well be a teacher after I'm dead. So why don't I just give you my body? But there's a catch. You have to keep my dogs with me. Grover Krantz died shortly after his conversation with David Hunt. And as soon as his ticker stopped, another clock started. The race was on. His body did not get to pass funeral go, and instead he was directly shipped to the great state of Tennessee, where his body was sent to a body farm. A few years later, after it was articulated and assembled with great care and expertise, Grover Krantz's remains were sent to the Smithsonian. Which it turns out, to backtrack for a quick second, fourth graders think body farms are very different than what they actually are. They are places where forensically inclined scientists study decay rates in human bodies. So what if we put this body in mud? And what if we put this one under a tree? What if we put this one in a hot container? All of this study and research helps and aid in future investigations that can go on to help forensic specialists pinpoint a timeline of death and maybe a suspicious death. 
or it could fill in the blanks with missing persons who are maybe later found dead decades later. It's not, as my kiddo asked with a quizzical look, a farm where you just get legs on trees. What would that even look like? Like a, a banana bunch, right? But with legs instead curling towards the sun with those little toes? Sorry. So given the timing of the image of the post pair circulating on social media in August of 2021, and knowing that there are dog science laboratories all over the country, often tied to universities, it might make sense to think that this guy was maybe a dog scientist or worked with dogs to save lives. He did something big, and he loved his animals. I mean, his body was displayed at the Smithsonian Museum for Pete's sake. He must be super big and super into dogs. This must be the intersection of these two circles in this not-quite-a-Venn-diagram depiction of this man. But Dr. Krantz actually died in 2002, long before the majority of the canine cognition laboratories had even started to boom. Dr. Krantz absolutely loved dogs, that is undeniable. And Dr. Krantz was also a scientist, but those two things never intersected in a way that we might jump to assume today. According to the description in the Smithsonian exhibit, Big Clyde, along with the bone remains of three other dogs, Iki, Yahoo, and Lika, were displayed with Dr. Grover Krantz, who was an anthropologist. Which, given his profession and his area of expertise, this explains why he had the dogs in the 70s that still had bone remains accessible and usable in the 2000s for display. What was omitted from his history in the Smithsonian display? but was absolutely noted in the Smithsonian articles on the same subject, is that Dr. Grover Krantz is often noted as the very first, or only, professional and scientist to consider Bigfoot as real. Cryptozoology is, to me, the crystal ball reading of the zoology world. It may be fun to think about, there are great stories with Bigfoot and, and other mythical beasts like unicorns, but to prove that they really existed in the way that we think of today, when there is no evidence, is a bit of a stretch. However, the fact that there is no concrete evidence does help these cases get steam. You cannot prove a negative. You just keep digging and digging and digging some more. Fringe science in a nutshell. But on the other hand, what? is science, data, and information without pushing the boundaries of what is already known. The whole purpose of science is to study, to understand, to ask questions, and to back it up. Einstein was considered probably downright looney tunes at the time of his theory of relativity. Maybe not. This piece isn't about him and I didn't study it at all. But the idea that he was able to come up with these theories about black holes that were proven in the 2000s was bananas. Real bananas, not curly legs growing from trees bananas. So the whole purpose of science is to study, to understand, to ask questions, and to back it up. Answer the why, the how, and push the boundaries of what is previously known to go where no man or woman or neither, neither, both has gone before. And while Dr. Krantz was reported to be the butt of the jokes at Washington State University where he studied human evolution, the truth of the matter is what is Bigfoot other than a large ape-like creature, right? It exists in native lore and in current TLC shows. So what if instead of looking for wackadoo stuff that doesn't currently exist, what if we thought of it more as a jumping stone from apes to man? Well, this theory might hold a little more water. Maybe. So Grover Krantz knew that without a body, a piece of anything, no one would ever believe him. It's a six to 800 pound, six foot animal. How can we not find him or his evidence? Occam's razor says that the easiest explanation is often the best. And if there was any proof that a six foot, 800 pound walking shag carpet might be part of the evolution to human, or maybe a branch that died off as we kept on chugging along down evolution's road to homo sapiens, some say we would have found it by now. Some say it likely didn't exist. So let's look at other examples of mythical creatures with real life examples in today's world that have been explained in different unusual ways. 
the Kraken and the images of mythical tentacled aquatic beasts and old tiny maps. We've all seen them. The little sketches in the ocean, the little drawings, the big portraits of the, the ship being taken down by a giant squid. Well, it turns out that the root of the mythical Kraken might be nothing more, and I'm so glad I'm not making this up, whale penises. You see, the penis of the North Atlantic right whale can be at least 1.8 meters long. And it could easily be taken by a naive witness for a tail, as a serpent, or as a tentacle. The irony of one particular sea serpent incident reported in 1875 was that a particular white pillar-like serpent was seen slithering in the midst of a pod of sperm whales, which was described as frantic with excitement. Of course it was sperm whales. Of course. But if there was absolute proof of Bigfoot, I bet a lot of people, hi, I am that people, would absolutely do an about turn. I'm very much in the Sasquatch agnostic camp. I will believe it when I see it. And in Grover Kranz's own words, quote, they're not going to accept the existence of the Sasquatch until definitive evidence comes in. They're taking a legitimate skeptical attitude. They want to see definitive proof of a body or a piece of one. Which is why he tried to build and assemble helicopters from kits to search for evidence from up above of a body, a fossil, something with little success. It's also why when he went out, he took a shotgun. Science wanted a body and he was going to get a body, no questions asked. Science, man. It's not all about blowing stuff up in a lab and counting bacteria colonies. Sometimes you just got to go out and shoot an eight-foot-tall walking shag carpet. The decision to kill the creature divided the cryptozoology world in half. It was as controversial as posting which way you mount your toilet paper. It was that bad. Things were said, and some things you just can't take back. Grover's drive to bring back a corpse wasn't intended to be cruel. It was in his reasoning to prove that Bigfoot existed so others could be afforded critical protection. Quote, it's not yet been established that Sasquatch exists, Krantz wrote in his book, The Scientist Looks at Sasquatch. Quote, to pass laws against harming Sasquatches presently makes little more sense than protecting unicorns. Which, you know, I agree. <laughs> But for him, laws like this wouldn't make sense because without proof that these things existed, the law was moot. So logically, eh, he had to get the proof. Logically. And it was that drive to prove his theory that made him hop into his car every single time someone called him with a sighting or a footprint or some sort of hope it's proof. He would listen to the reports. Which is meaningful to those who saw what they think they saw, or saw what they actually saw. We all want to and need to be believed, right? So Dr. Krantz gave them that for sure, while he tried to prove against all odds the existence of, as of today, a mythical creature. What is undeniably true? The scientific community is rigid, often snooty towards those with other ideas. Galileo, anyone? More relevant to my profession? Decades ago, we didn't think dogs had emotional range, and now we know all kinds of animals, dogs included, can feel pain, fear, joy, and more. Science takes data and discovers new information all the time. That's the point. And it makes new assertions that can help guide new guidelines. See COVID. What else is undeniably true? Dr. Grover Krantz wanted to teach in life and in death, and he did that. Not only were his bones and those of Clyde and the rest displayed at the Smithsonian Museum, the beacon of all things super cool and interesting, but his body has gone on to be used to teach forensics and advanced osteology at George Washington University. So you don't have to be a ghost teacher in the Harry Potter universe to keep teaching after death. He contributed to science by describing the function of the mastoid process, a bone that you can find right now protruding from behind your ears. And that bone is found only in modern humanoids. He's published on genetics, on race, on language, and more. What is undeniably true is that he absolutely loved his dogs. And Clyde left a dog-sized hole in his heart when he passed away. 
So when Clyde died in 1973, Grover Krantz buried him with the intention to dig him up later. Remember, anthropologist. And as many of us who love animals, dogs especially, Grover Krantz had dogs before Clyde, dogs after Clyde, but they were not Clyde. In fact, when Grover Krantz had to exhume Clyde's body, dig it up and inspect, it's reported that Grover Krantz downed a gallon of liquid courage. Don't do that, kids. Before starting the excavation, he said, I could more easily have cleaned off the skeleton of my own father. But what we don't know is if Dr. Grover Krantz was right. Let's say for the sake of argument that there are remains of a Sasquatch found in 2044. All of the naysayers, myself included, will take that information and eventually look back and say, this man was an absolute genius, legend, before his time. But let's say nothing is ever found. He'll still be seen as a brilliant anthropologist with quirky ideas who contributed to multiple fields of scientific discovery in life. Some would quantify it as legitimate scientific discovery, but that's just an unfair slight. And he also happened to believe that Bigfoot was real, and he died looking for that proof. Listen to the episode on the men who stared at goats about conspiracy theories and how they start. What it comes down to for me, did Grover Krantz look at the evidence and keep searching for evidence of something there? Maybe there was a link from giant ape to something else. And maybe he spent his life searching for his white whale. Or did he cross the line in light of all evidence on the table, continue defending the notion that Bigfoot was real, using circular arguments defending the indefensible, and the white whale was really an upside-down sperm whale with an erection for days. We actually just don't know. And I will say that while I personally only believe in the Yeti that I'm speaking into, thanks Blue Yeti Microphone for making all of this possible, if evidence to the contrary were to appear, I would listen and adjust with evidence. And that's what science is. And that's what by all accounts I read that Grover Krantz knew. And while he believed, truly believed, he knew he had to prove it. But you can't prove a negative according to the burden of proof. At least, at least not on as large a claim as this. So Grover Krantz died bigfootless, luckily not in a DIY helicopter wreck, and he went on to teach more scientific principles, his beloved anthropology, long after his death in 2002. Honestly, I think that regardless of his beliefs in life, as bonkers as it might sound to some people in broad strokes, he knew what he had to do and he sought out to do it because science. And that is amazing and exactly how science should work. It's not always the big eureka. It's not always the clean ending. But for Grover Krantz, going on to continue teaching while his spirit was gone and his body remained, it is a most remarkable, incredible gift to the students and to science that continues on without him. And this is to be applauded. So if you are a budding anthropologist, there happens to be a scholarship available at Washington State University in Dr. Krantz's honor. The Dr. Grover S. Krantz Scholarship in Physical Anthropology is given to an exceptional undergraduate or graduate student majoring in anthropology and demonstrating outstanding promise in anthropology in the fields of physical, biological anthropology, linguistic archaeology, and or human demography. This is a bi-faculty nomination. You don't even have to apply. So just suck up to your teachers. You'll be fine. If reading Dr. Krantz's books on Bigfoot is your jam, go for it. Enjoy. But if you prefer to read something else by Dr. Krantz, his book, Only a Dog, a memoir of his life with Clyde, is available, though it has zero reviews on Amazon. His books on Bigfoot have many more. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this show, please subscribe, tell a friend, go to Podchaser, leave a review, anything helps. And I'm not sure if this is going to be a bonus episode yet or a regular episode. We're moving in September, so if you haven't supported on Patreon, consider doing that for more episodes like this, more content and goodies. 
And if you have supported on Patreon and you're listening on that feed, hey, thanks for supporting the show. Whew, look at me covering all the bases. So I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club. I'm on my way right now to teach my very last class in person with them before my move. If you're listening from any DTC, I'm going to miss you. Thanks for 11 years of trusting me with your dogs. I'm also the author of Considerations for the City Dog. Now y'all know what to do. Go get curious. I got today's information from smithsonianmag.com, alumni.berkeley.edu, the LA Times obituary for Dr. Krantz, and cooney.edu on the burden of proof. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by NK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share with all of your curious friends. You know what every other podcaster tells you to do. And I will see you next week. <laughs>